Okay, we're on. Hello and welcome. I'm Christoph Irwin with Positive Energy. We're a building science consulting shop and engineering shop in Austin, Texas. I'm talking to you today about manual J load calculations. So since you're here, I assume you know what they are. They're, they're a load calculation to, that's involved in air conditioning sizing. We're going to do a little bit of background and then dig right in. This is the introductory video. One of our engineers, Kimberly Llewellyn, is going to be handling the rest of the videos. So let's just jump right in, get going. Big picture, what are we doing? We are sizing mechanical equipment to match the load of the building. Why are we doing that? Here, here's the basic strategy why. What we're doing, the basic strategy when it comes to any home is uh, we want to deliver comfort to our clients. And the strategy for that is you go inside and you control that environment. Well, since the weather is uh, usually always changing depending on where you live, well then, if the weather's changing, the inside environment wants to stay the same, that means the loads have to change. It's kind of like a teeter-totter. If this changes, this has to change. So that's it. We go inside, we want the environment to be the same, and the loads therefore change. And we need to know what's the biggest heating load, what's the biggest cooling load over a course of a year that we need to make sure that we can control or we're failing to keep our clients comfortable. Um, this is actually not a secret, but this is the subtle theme behind the energy codes, right? We know energy codes have been coming down or up in stringency, down in energy use, and their basic strategy there is to make that control of the environment better and better, more insulation, better air control. This reduces the loads on the mechanical equipment. It means their mechanical equipment runs less, and this means that it uses less energy because it's running less. So. The basic strategy there is reflected in this curve. You can see the energy is coming down over time as we go through different levels of the International uh, Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. And we're somewhere close to around 50% down from the baseline, right? With baseline being 2003. So what we see on there is that, that strategy of go inside and control the environment. And there's another important distinction here is that when we insulate more and air seal more, the physics of the buildings change. So those of you who have many decades of experience, the buildings look very similar, but they function and the physics is very different, especially with moisture control. And with these load calculations, you're going to get less load. That means you have fewer CFMs, cubic feet per minute of air, to deliver to the space. It means that there's some other things you need to be paying attention to just beyond just the manual J. Um, and once again, so there are standards to deliver comfort, thermal comfort specifically. And these standards are written by engineers. And these engineers don't use terms like what you see here, that state of mind that expresses satisfaction. Engineers don't use state of mind in their sentences unless they really have to. So key takeaway from this is thermal comfort is incredibly subjective. And in fact, it's statistically likely you will deliver comfort uh, when you follow these standards, but there's the possibility that someone will, will want um, colder or hotter conditions. But still, manual J is the load calculation. It's here to deliver comfort, and it's very important that you uh, keep that in mind. So when we talk about thermal comfort, we're talking about a range of factors, right? We have a, we have a little chart here. We see the two of them in brown, clothing and metabolic rate. Nothing you can do. Those are subjective. But the other four, right? So there's air velocity, the radiant temperature, the temperatures of the, all the surfaces around me in this room right now, I'm exchanging heat with them, and the humidity of the space are all factors as well as dry bulb temperature or air temperature. And it's important to know dry bulbs in green because that's, that's the one we go to, right? We go, okay, I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to go to my thermostat and I'm going to lower the temperature or I'm going to raise the temperature. But really that's just one factor among many that, that control thermal comfort. And more importantly, when we're inside a space, it's not all about thermal comfort. Many, many other factors of the space are shown here. They get integrated in our heads, in your clients' heads, and they will affect their experience of a space. So thermal comfort is one of them. Indoor air quality is another. Light quality, sound, odor, vibration, they're all listed here. Our clients, us, when we're inside a space, we're always integrating these. It could be... Something with the air quality. The air could have high CO2, and we might go, oh, it's, I don't know, it's just bad in here. I'm going to call my HVAC guy and say he screwed up. So it's important to know that there's a range of factors. And there's a lot more to say about IEQ. You can, you can Google things, some things on here. 
And there's going to be a reference, uh, healthyheating.com has some great information on IEQ. But overall, we want to point out that a great indoor environment is not just thermal comfort, and thermal comfort is certainly not just your thermostat set point. So there's a lot of information in that, in that cross-section there to dig into if you're interested. And it's just like a car here. See, see a hot rod car? It's one thing. You can believe that the designers of that car tried to think about the range of factors that the driver is going to experience. Not just the engine, but the engine sound. I mean, not just the, the acceleration of the engine, but the sound, the visuals, the tactile experience, the ergonomics, everything. Right? Sound system. Everything's been thought of for that one goal, performance. And we left room for the engine. Right? This is something, those of you in the design industry out there, builders, um, architects for sure, uh, designers, please remember that we leave room for the comfort delivery engine and leave room in a good space and you know hint 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 this is not a hot attic in a hot climate that is not leaving room that is not leaving room and putting it in the attic so if that's done definitely for energy efficiency and comfort you're going to need to do some things well yeah no not for comfort but just for energy efficiency you're going to need to work hard to uh, keep that house efficient if your ducts are in the attic in a hot attic and in, that's going to be um, not code compliant shortly here. So again, we leave room for the engine. We make sure that these goals can be met. Comfort, durability, health and safety, and energy efficiency. We want all those met. All right, so that, that's the overarching picture of what we're doing. Let's talk about Manual J. Let's talk about what it is. It is, well, here's the full name, right? We call it Manual J, but this is sort of a, the full name. It's the ANSI ACA Manual J Residential Peak Load calculation procedure and this is the eighth edition so there you go there's a mouthful so ANSI is the American National Standards Institute this is a peer-reviewed process a continually updated standard it's a big deal it's a lot of work um, often a lot of uh, very skilled highly trained people volunteering their time to ensure that the standard stays um, stays current stays relevant and is able to be peer-reviewed get public input on it um, ACA is the American Contractors, let's see, it's the Air Conditioning Contractors of America, ACA, A-C-C-A, and they are the, the group that applied to ANSI to have their standard be an ANSI standard, and they were successful. And Manual J is, is it referenced back to back in the day when it was a manual, actual paper, you know, folder manual that you would read page one, enter some project information, page two, you know, the floor plan information, you take numbers on As you go through the manual, you get to the end, you would have your loads for heating and your loads for cooling. It is no longer a, a paper manual. And the letter was just the next letter up when they do it. There is another link to podcast uh, to a podcast where the author of the manual, J. Hank, Hank Rutkowski, whose name I can't read on the cover there, uh, he's interviewed, and I believe he says in that interview that the J was just the next letter due. Uh, I'm pretty sure on that. Since then, he's made some changes so that um, manual S has to do with sizing, uh, manual P has to do with psychrometrics, which starts with a P, things like that. Um, RS is residential systems. So he's tried to change the letters to to um, not be just letters, like sequentially, but letters that uh, apply to what's happening there. So Manual J, it's the ANSIACA Manual J. It's for residential loads. The word peak is in red because it is simply a peak load calculation. It is not uh, a load calculation that's done for every hour of the year. It's going to tell you the peak cooling load and the peak heating load. And some of the software tools will give you some graphs to show you some time variation. But still, the, the output, the tabular data outputs are peak loads. And it's a calculation procedure that is actually coming out of the ASHRAE world. And it changes over time. And when they change the underlying calculation methodology, they don't call it um, manual K, right? They don't switch to a new letter. They simply change the edition. And we are in the eighth edition right now. And maybe the ninth edition is due. I know that there's been some talk about uh, revising manual J to deal with the, the new era of high performance home, the new breadth of possibility in the homes world. Manual J has been, been out for quite a while. So let's talk about ASHRAE again. So ASHRAE is another acronym, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. 
And it is a standards organization that it doesn't just look at residential buildings, doesn't look to look at commercial buildings from a mechanical system standpoint, as you might see, heating, refrigeration, and air conditioning engineers. But those guys are smart, and they realize that it's one thing, right? Like the car was one thing. That driver doesn't say, let me drive my engine chassis thing, right? It's a car. It's one thing. It's a home. It's one thing. It's, it's something that we use to live in, and it's something that we go to to be comfortable in. So ASHRAE is thinking about homes that way, thinking about buildings that way. So they're looking at the mechanical systems, the enclosure, the testing methodologies, um, thermal comfort standards, ventilation standards, a tremendous variety, a cross section of topics are in the ASHRAE world. And some of them are load calculation procedures, right? So the current one we use is called the cooling load temperature difference method, CLTD. No, no. It's the, um, yeah, the cooling low temperature difference method. And it's a modified version of the heat transfer method. And there's a great reference on this also listed here. And this is Bill Smith from Elite Software who writes one of the Manual J uh, software tools. And it's RHVAC, so residential HVAC. So the letter R and HVAC. And it is definitely a fantastic reference to look at. If you're interested in the history of this and sort of the connection to other underlying engineering procedures, which is very interesting stuff. It's very interesting to understand that it's evolving over time. There's a lot of thought going into it to make it more accurate. There's also a lot of comparison between um, what the loads come out from these software tools and how they work in the real world when this procedure is followed. So remember here, just summarizing again. So it's a residential peak load calculation procedure. This is the eighth edition, that's the current one. And the goal is to separate the inside from the outside using the enclosure and using the mechanical systems to deliver the comfort. A little subtlety here, when we say load, right, it's, it's very tempting to think of, okay, I'm going to load my pickup truck, and if I carry a heavier load, I should switch from a, an F-150 to an F-250, right, something like that, or an F-350 if I carry a heavy load. That's sort of similar. It's not completely wrong, but the load in an HVAC calculation, a cooling load, a heating load, um, when you talk about a cooling load, you're talking about a rate of energy entering the building. So a certain number of BTUs, which is energy, over a certain period of time, we use an hour in the Imperial Units world. So the number of BTUs per hour coming through all the walls, the roof, the floor, all those BTUs get added up. And the biggest number that you would get adding those all up every hour of the year, that is your peak load. That's what's coming out of manual J. So keep, keep in mind, a cooling load is a rate. It's a rate of energy exchange. And the manual J is a peak load calculation software. I think we've stressed that. There are three types of loads. Let's talk about those now. There's extreme load. So that would be wherever you live, the hottest day anyone can remember, that is an extreme load. So we clearly do not want to design our mechanical equipment for that, or the rest of the year it'll be tremendously oversized. Right? So we have what we call a design load. This is a typical meteorological year. It is not an actual year. It's a year that um, we, we have sort of typical months and then we smooth the data together to get typical years. Um, so when we base our load calculations on that, which is what we do, we go to ASHRAE, we look up a, the typical meteorological year, and we pull our design data out of that. So for instance, Austin, Texas, 99 degrees is my design load, excuse me, is my design, um, temperature for cooling, and 30 degrees is my design temperature for heating. And then there is part load, which is the rest of the year, <laughs> which is uh, peak load is a small few hours of the year, maybe, I don't know, 80, 80 hours of the year at max would be at your design conditions. And what we have again now when we talk about uh, load and the middle of, and the building staying the same, and it's the capacity of the equipment here. So these are important terms, and I wanted, just want us to take away, just to be very, very clear, load has to do with weather on the enclosure. Outdoor conditions affect the enclosure to create loads. So to deal with those loads, we need to offset the load with the capacity of our equipment to deal with it. This kind of ties into that pickup truck metaphor pretty well, right? If I have a load that's a very heavy load, I need the capacity of my pickup truck to move that load. 
right? It, if you put it into um, some small pickup truck, you'd just squash it. It couldn't handle that load. So uh, think about the load on those giant mining uh, dump trucks. So load has to do with the weather. Load has to do with the buildings. Capacity has to do with the equipment. And capacity is an interesting one. You know, if you hear a system is a, is a three-ton system, well, that means it has a capacity of three tons, which is three times 12,000 BTUs an hour, so 36,000 BTUs an hour. Right? So keep in mind, it's a rate. That's a, so we, we're saying that it has the capacity to deliver 36,000 BTUs per hour. And then if your peak load is that or less, well, it has the capacity to handle your peak load. That's what we're looking for here with manual J. So we know load and capacity. These, these terms can sometimes, I don't know, seem uh, confusing. And I can actually remember feeling mixed up, which is load, which is capacity. Um, there's other terms like sensible heat ratio. You get mixed up. Is that with the weather or the enclosure or the equipment, things like that? So with load and capacity, it's very important that we keep these separate. The load is something we know, right? Like, look at this car going up a hill. The load on that engine is the uh, how steep the hill is, how fast the car wants to go, accelerating up it, and uh, how heavy the car is, right? So those all contribute to load. And the capacity of the engine is how powerful the engine is. And when we're in a car, we do match the capacity to the load all the time. We use our accelerator pedal, right? We let up when we don't need capacity. We put our foot down. We want more, more of the engine's capacity to deliver, be delivered to the load. So we don't just use the key and floor it. So that's an important distinction. Part load is a big deal. Part load is real. You can see these. What we have here is on the vertical axis is the load. Excuse me. Yeah, I said it right. The load and then time across the bottom. So we can see this is a bedroom on the top there. And it, it pretty much doubles. You have from 4,000 to 8,000 BTUs an hour over the course of the day. So you can see the peak load moments are the peaks there, those little ski ramps. And then the rest of the time we're at part load conditions. So there are three types of loads, right? There's extreme load, design load, and part load. There are also three types of capacity, right? Most of the US market has this type of capacity, this what's called a single speed system. And its capacity is, like I just said, three tons. In, in, in this building here, we have a three ton system. And when we don't like three tons, it turns off. We have zero tons, three tons. Those are the two capacities we get to pick from. Be like our engine just with the key, right? Just floored and with the key. So that's very common and um, starting to go away because it's, it doesn't have much ability to deal with part load very efficiently, but it is able to be sized by manual J. The second type of capacity that we have is dual stage and uh, unloaded compressors where you have full capacity and you have no capacity or off, and then you have something in the middle, either 50% or 67%. But depending on if it's a dual stage, you get 50% and 67 if it's an unloader. And there's some simplifications there, but that, that's, that's generally a clear way to understand it. So the third type of capacity, that was the second one, the third one is variable capacity. You can see here on the bottom, uh, single speed on and off, dual stage on off, something in the middle, variable capacity, it has on, it has off, and then it has this broad range that it goes, its low end is usually 10% of peak capacity, and they then continuously varying everywhere in there, much more like an accelerator pedal on cars. This is the direction much of the market is going, and um, very similar to carburetors and fuel injectors, fuel injection systems over time, if that metaphor works for you. Go find a new car today with a carburetor. That I know of, there are none. And not that long ago, that's all there were. So there was a period of time where some vehicles had carburetors, some didn't, and now it's all gone, gone away. Um, it's all fuel injector. Very similar. Part load efficiency is a big deal, and therefore variable capacity equipment is starting to dominate the market. All right, so now, manual J proper. I'm going to do our quick introduction and get on with it. So... Manual J is not an isolated manual. I mentioned they talked about the letters. Look at these, look on this chart here. We see that on, just let's look at the residential column, which is the one on the left. The system concept is manual RS, so residential system. Manual J is the load calculation. Zoning residential, manual ZR. Air distribution, T, think, um, think terminal device. Those are your uh, diffusers, things like that. Um, equipment selection, S. Sizing, selection, equipment selection, manual S. 
duct sizing D ducts manual D and then adjust test and balance is uh, manual B and there's a couple others we'll, we'll talk about those next so if we look at this here from going from red to dark blue on those arrows we have the stages of the mechanical system design process and we're going to run through them briefly but I want to point out here the three on the bottom manual B was balancing we actually did talk about that manual H is for heat pump systems and manual P it's an unsung awesome manual very very clear if you're in a humid climate or your summers are humid try to get a hold of manual P take a look at it if you have uh, if you have trouble finding it you might have to break down and order it if you can't do that just come to Austin Texas go to our office and take a look we have it for you it's a, it's a very very interesting um, manual very clear so let's start with the process now manual RS so manual RS, residential systems, this is the basic system concept. Do I have a gas furnace? Do I have a mini split? Do I have radiant walls? Do I have radiant floors? What's my basic strategy for delivering heating and cooling? And there are many. We think of it like, oh, gas furnace, air conditioner, done, right? Indoor unit, outdoor unit on the air conditioner. And that's not the case, right? Even in the heat pump world, right? Do you do one-to-one um, uh, -one heat pump? Do you do a multi-split heat pump? Um, you know, beyond the refrigerant cycle, there are um, holy grail-like compressorless systems out there with uh, desiccant-based humidity control and evaporative cooling for, to provide cooling, so desiccant evaporative systems. So manual RS is that basic, um, what's your approach? Manual J is what we're talking about today. It's a residential peak load calculation. I missed the important word peak here. And, you know, peak load would be like you stand on the scale. What's the peak weight? Um, it's delivering a rate. That's very important. Another subtlety here is that it is a fairly simple calculation. And it has been simplified, or it was originally simplified, because we're doing this calculation by hand. Well, now we have a hand calculation. I'm sorry, we have a um, load calculation reduced in complexity so that it can be done by hand. And then we run it on computers. So at some point, there's probably going to be a transition to some more sophistication, not necessarily on the input side, which Kimberly is going to be talking about, but on the computational uh, sophistication below below deck that you don't really see. So that was manual RS, manual J. Next one is manual S. This is the sizing. This is the one where we pick, do I need a 350? And this is a dually. Or do you know my final with the F-150, that kind of thing. So what we need to do is we need to take that three-ton system that was rated at these standard AHRI rating conditions, and we need to derate it. So um, I have a note on my phone there. Turn that off. Uh, battery's going low. So manual S, is, it's not the subject here, but I think I want to give you a big sense. That's this introduction. I want to give you a sense of what's around the manual J, so uh, you'll, have, you'll have an idea where, where we're coming from. So manual S, once we've done the loads, so first we take our concept up, and then we do the loads. Then we size our equipment. Now we know exactly how many CFMs we have, how many cubic feet of air per minute we're going to be needing to move around the space. That makes us ready for what? That makes us ready to size the air distribution system. This is the plenums, the filters, the trunk lines, the runouts, the diffusers, all of that. You could even say the chassis is part of the air distribution system, the return plenum or return grill, anything that the, the conditioned air, if, we are, if we're using air as our primary conditioning fluid, Anything that touches that that's uh, going to be in this process, but the trunks and ducts specifically, that's manual D. And all the fittings, right, all the fittings here. Those are equivalent lengths, 80 feet, 30 feet, things like that shown there. Okay, so after manual D comes manual T. And manual T is the terminal devices, right? Just diffusers, the terminal device would be the air coming out the end of a hose. That hose end would be a terminal device. We know these things from the dashboard of our car. It's the piece that the air shoots out. We call it a terminal device. And there's a lot to say about that. That is where you could say the rubber meets the road on getting air into your building. The very last thing it does is it should shoot out. It's going to have a spread, a certain amount of drop, a certain throw. All those are, are very important to understand, to deliver comfort reliably, to avoid drafts. Okay? So there are a lot of software tools available. There are six that I was able to find that are approved. This is according to the ACCO website. And of those six, based on my perspective of doing this for 10 years now, the big two are WrightSoft and Elite. Right? The other ones you can see here, Energy Gauge is, is one. That's another compliance software out of the ResNet world. 
Very cool software. It actually does an 8760, which is 24 hours a day times 365 days a year, 8760 hours. It does 8760 calculations and just keeps the peaks. There's Carmel software, there's CoolCalc, and there's HeatCAD. You can look up information on their websites. If you go to ACA's website, we'll put a link there on that for that website. You can find a list of approved uh, manual J softwares. But like I said, the big two are WriteSoft and Elite. There's no huge difference between the two. There are some um, some subtleties, I guess. I don't really know what to say about them, you know. And and um, they're both good. They're both useful. They generate very similar results. They both have the same um, weak spot, which is that you know that what's it called? Gigo, garbage in, garbage out, garbage out. G I G O. Um, you need to make sure that the that the software is getting the proper inputs because it's not going to know. It's not going to say, oh, that window couldn't be that big. It's going to say, oh, that window's that big. Um, yeah, the base package of WriteSoft comes with a drawing program, and Elite has definitely a drawing board program as well. But Elite also has these input screens that you can see here, where you input the room, you know, the perimeter, the room dimensions, the height, the things like that, very directly. And I guess if, you, if I were to do a broad generalization, at the risk of um, stepping on some toes here, I would say that for the most part, WriteSoft is done when you're first getting into the manual J world, and you just want to put your draw your building, get your loads, get on with it. There's nothing, there's no problem with that. That's a good thing. Do the manual Js. Use WriteSoft. As you want to have more, um, I don't want to say intimacy, but that sounds weird. As you really want to get into it more, know that you're changing specific numbers and see their impact on the loads. Elite software, especially with these input dialogues pages, it's a good way to do that. And I'd say that most of the, you know, the contractor world's using WriteSoft, and a lot of the kind of research science modes are, are using Elite in their shops. So once again, we're doing the recap now. We're almost done. Peak load calculation. Manual J is a peak load calculation, and its full pedigreed name is quite long. ANZIAC Manual J Residential Peak Load Calculation Procedure, 8th edition. Um, peak load is one moment in time. You know, it occurs a few times a year, a few hours a year. I guess you could say, depends on if you're using the 1% or 2% hours of the year. So maybe, oh, 10 hours a year, 20 hours a year, you can hit peak load, something like that. But you need to size for that. Um, you can see here I have, uh, 3,230 hours of the year that equipment's going to be running in, in my area. So, but the point is, part load is real. You need to deal with it. And we, the goal of our equipment is to match the load to the capacity. This is one of the reasons variable capacity equipment's coming in. And here's a big reason to consider manual J, right? It is in the code. It has been in the code for a long time, for 10 years now. In 2006, it was referenced through the IRC, the IECC, the uh, International Energy Conservation Code didn't reference Manual J directly, but it referenced the IRC in the mechanical section, which referenced Manual J. 2009, both Manual J and Manual S are in the codes, and 2000 through the IRC. 2012 on, IECC references uh, J and S directly. All right, so the final thought I want to leave you with is why think about manual J is to think about thermal comfort. You want to make sure you to leave, leave your clients comfortable, and manual J is at the heart of right-sizing your equipment to make that happen. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of these seminars with Kimberly Llewellyn. Thank you.